Um, well, I did a lot of logs and, you know, the battle, when I first came, the battle was primarily between urban and rural. Mm -hmm. Not so much uh, Democrats versus Republicans. Uh, now you, it's, it's more partisan in nature, and then even within that, you have people who come with their viewpoints, and uh, irrespective of what the, the facts may be, you know, um, their, their own thinking or philosophy trumps the facts. Mm -hmm. That makes it very difficult to debate, mm -hmm. you know, so. Answer uh, questions, or I mean, just, you know, observing. The back and forth between the mics. Yeah, you know, it's, you know, you still have to, you have, you still have to love the place. You know, I still, I still very much love the place, but it's, but it's different, mm -hmm. and so you have to work. You, have to, you constantly have to revise your strategies and how on, on how to get from point A to point B. Um, you know, but it's, you know, it's a part of it. You know. How much and related to the project we're working on, uh, we do hear mentions. Uh, Bible verses and God, and we we have every session. Um, yeah. for you yourself included. I've, you know, I have a couple sound bites. I think from you quoting different parts. But how much does God influence your lawmaking? Again, thirteen sessions. Well, I mean, pretty much. I mean, it's, it goes to the core of who I am. I mean, be, before I was a legislator, you know, you know, I was born again. Um, you know, I I come out of a of, of a strong Baptist background. You know, my father was a senior deacon. Uh, my mom uh, was active in the church. We grew up in the church. Uh, and quite frankly, um, in my entire political public life, uh, the faith-based community has played a very strong role and still, and still very much does. So, um, you know, it's, 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 you can't just separate that from who you are. You know, now sometimes, you know, people will see it in different ways, so to speak. Um, but it's, 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 it, it represents my core values and, and who I am, and I, I don't run away from that. As far as issues, are there uh, any issues or stances you've taken on particular bills um, where you've turned to your faith for the answer? Well, you know, for in, in my 25, this is my 26th year in the legislature. Um, I've always fought for, uh, I say, um, um, you know, children, seniors. And then I say everyone in between, um, and that goes direct. And, and those who are less fortunate, the poor, uh, those who have don't necessarily have a voice, and you have to be their voice. Uh, and in the in the in the in the Bible, there's a there's a scripture that says, "To him to whom much is required, much is given; much is required," which means that where you've been blessed, the blessing is not just for you. You become a vehicle by which blessings flow through. Uh, and then it talks about, um, you know, I was homeless, and you pretty much like you, you ignored me. I was in prison. You didn't come to visit me. Um, so that's a part of who I am, you know, in terms of representing those who cannot speak for themselves. Uh, recognize that there are many who are uh, fortunate, uh, and if you don't give voice to them, if you don't have people to see them, uh, then... Uh, you run the risk of, of the system ignoring them. And then there's, the, uh, there's a part in St. Luke, talks about the Good Samaritan, man who it was, was hurt, um, was robbed. Uh, they left him on the side of the road. And then you had the priest to come by, saw him, and went to the other side. You had a number of people who saw him and went to the other side. And then you, you, then you had the, uh, the Samaritan who came along. And he didn't ask, you know, if I help this man, what would happen to me? What he asked, if I don't help this man, what would happen to him? Uh, that's a part that has helped to shape who I am. And that is, is that if we don't speak for those who are without health care, those who are in need of education, uh, those who are in, um, incarcerated, uh, those who really need our help, um, then it's not about what's going to happen to me, it's about what will happen to them if you're put in a position and you don't speak for them. Uh, so, yeah, that's a, that's a part of my faith. That's a part of who I am. Now, I don't necessarily have to go up there and be in the house and shout it out. I don't have to do that because my faith also says that it should be demonstrated in my actions and people ought to be able to see it. Uh, and so, yeah, 20, 26 years, 
Um, uh, that is who I am. In fact, when I, before I came here, my dad died when I was 13 of cancer. Um, the pastor of the church kind of took, you know, you know, took me under his wings. Uh, he thought I was going to be a pastor, thought I was going to be a minister. I told him I was going to be a lawyer. He was disappointed by that. Uh, uh, but then when I came back from law school and started practicing law and then told him I was running for office, you know, that disappointed him too. Still thought I was going to be a minister. And then he said something to me uh, later on. And he said, uh, he said, Brother Turner, you can be a minister in many different ways. You don't have to be behind this pulpit. And so in your public service, let your public service be your ministry. And if you'll operate in that vein, uh, then I think you'll do well. And I have always remembered that. And that is uh, my public service, me being in this Texas House of Representatives, that this is my ministry. And so what I do, what I say, is reflective of my ministry. And then it's reflective of the God that I serve. So, you know, I don't want to walk around here uh, as if it's all about me. Because if you exalt yourself, you'll bring you down. I don't want to operate around here <clears throat> as if I'm better than anyone else or trying to discriminate against somebody uh, because you know, their lifestyle may be different from mine or their views may be different. Because, you know, the book that I read says you have no uh, respect of persons. You treat everybody the same. Uh, and so that's, the, yeah, my faith is a part of who I am. I don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. My job and my obligation is to take care of today. And then, uh, and then speak with, uh, on those things in which you, in which, in, that you believe and give it everything you have. And so I'm a passionate person, but it's a part of my ministry. So why shouldn't I be passionate about the things in which I believe? You mentioned education, and that's been an issue kind of at the forefront with pre-K and ex either expanding that or enhancing that. Um, how does religious, I mean, you know, we've, we've seen Patrick's advisory council call it, you know, an ungodly thing as far as pulling kids out of homes and that environment. Um, how do the two go hand in hand as far as when, you know, the way it's been melded this session between pre-K and and faith issues. Well, I mean, these are our children. Uh, we're blessed to have them. Uh, the good Lord has made us stewards of these kids. We owe it to these children to equip them with everything that they need in order that they can live out their life and reach their God-given potential. Um, and if you love them, you, you will give your kid everything that that kid needs. Um, if that means, for example, pre-K, if that will help to equip these kids to live a productive, quality lives, you give them pre-K, okay? If it means spending the, 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 the dollars to make sure that their education system is a quality one, to help them to be productive, to reach, to utilize their gifts and their talents, then you give them a quality education. Um, you know, we can fight about things we do not see. And the book even speaks about that. You can love someone that you don't see, and yet you hate or deny people that you see every day. And the book speaks about that. Um, and so uh, these kids are gifts. They are here. We see them. I think we are obligated to make sure that they are fed, make sure that they receive the health care that they rightfully deserve, to make sure that they get the quality education that they will need uh, th to protect them. You know, those are the things that I think we have a responsibility to do. That's what my faith says. And I can't see a kid who's in need and walk on the other side. And I can't treat a kid as if, you know, you are not my biological kid. So I don't have to do anything for you. My obligation is to assist you. Uh, and I can't say, you know, that you belong, you are the, your parents' responsibility. And I don't have a role to play. I do have a role to play. Okay? So, um, you know, but, you know, sometimes, you know, people can get things twisted. You know, but I think um, uh, we all have our own conscience. 
and we have our values. Uh, and then the question becomes, what are your values predicated on? And for me, um, you know, I don't think anyone can just claim that um, this is my God. Okay. I think you got to be very careful about that. I think God belongs to us all. He speaks to us all. Uh, but I think we are constantly asking for guidance and discernment. Uh, sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we get it wrong. And then I think we have to be humble enough to recognize when we get it wrong to acknowledge that and then to seek to get on the right road. Your role uh, is to look out for those kids and, and make sure they get the education, and that includes referencing a moment a few weeks ago uh, on abstinence-only education and shifting those dollars from uh, HIV yes. uh, prevention <coughs> measures. How does that, that was, a, you know, like I said, a, a heated moment. Yeah. What were your thoughts behind that? I did, you know, we did have you at the back of my commenting on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you know, how do you how do you pick between two children and their needs? Okay, how do you take from one and give to the other um, when you have an opportunity to give to them both? You know, if you want to provide funding, for example, to abstinence programs, okay, fine, I voted for that. Uh, but at the same time, recognize that they are if they are children and and adults and others that are walking around with HIV and AIDS. And I think we need to provide funding and the resources that they need as well. How do, how do I take one as a policymaker, take money from one and give to the other, or take one from one and give to the, on the other side? That's a difficult thing for me to do. Uh, I, I love them all. And I think your policies are, be, are to be reflective of that. Uh, and and that's, that's the lesson, even that's the biblical lesson. I mean, you had two moms. You know, one of the same child. Solomon said, okay, we'll just split the child in half. No. Um, so <laughs> I think, you know, we have the opportunity to do some meaningful things for all people, for example, in the state of Texas, to enhance their lives, to make their lives better. And I think we, we have a responsibility to do just that. But you cannot... Do for, one, do for one and take away from the other. I, I, to me, that do, it doesn't compute, and my faith rejects that. Okay? It just rejects that. Um, but that's, you know, that's, these are my beliefs. These are my core beliefs. These are my values. Uh, I come out of a family of nine. Uh, neither one of my parents graduated from high school. Nine kids. Six people could sit at the table at one time and eat. My mom cooked. My mom, when food was ready, my dad would say, okay, six of y'all come to the table and eat. Food is on the table. Six of us will go to the kitchen table. We will eat. And after what my daddy perceived to be a reasonable period of time, my daddy will walk in and he will say, that's it. The six of you that's at the table, it's time for you to get up. The others need to eat. Okay? And we had to get up. But the point was, what point, when, the point that he made to all of us, you may not be in the first six, but you will have an opportunity to be at the table. And there's going to be as much for the next group as for the first. Because the first group need to understand that there's a second group. So the first group, you can't take everything away. Recognize that your brothers and sisters are coming at, at a certain time. Those are the same principles that I brought to the Texas House. Everybody has to, f to know that there's a seat at the table. Everybody has to be recognized that we're going to be uh, respectful of who they are, attentive to their needs, and give them what they need. Uh, and we're not going to pick winners and losers. You mentioned that you are a voice for the voiceless and looking out for those um, how does that then relate as far as your faith and abortion? That's what, you know, a lot of uh, those across the aisle will say they want to give a voice. Nobody's, you know, representing those unborn children and defending those and, and making abortion, you know, restricting access and whatnot to protect life. Um, how, how do your views then relate to that issue? 
Well, I think, number one, I, I do believe in a woman's right to choose, a choice. I do believe that. Now, we can argue all day long when life is, 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 comes into existence. We can have, we can have that argument. Um, and I certainly, from the science point of view, we've kind of, drew, we've kind of made some distinctions when we define when life occurs. And I think we are respectful of that. Um, but I do recognize and I respect, for example, a woman's right to choose. I don't, I don't back away from that. Uh, but at, and at the same time, when that, that life, that fetus becomes life and is, is, uh, is, um, is uh, and, the, and the woman has given birth, then we have an obligation to do everything we can to be what I call pro-life. And that is make sure that that, that child has, uh, has the things that he or she will need in order to live a very fruitful and productive life. Because um, that is our responsibility. That's our obligation. The disconnect that I, that I have are for people who will fight so feverishly um, for, as they would say, life that they do not see. I don't see the same sort of commitment to people, to kids that are walking in, in homes every single day, that are struggling, that are hungry, that are poor, without health care, without assistance. What about those kids? So, you know, I'll respect a woman's right to choose. And I'm also prepared to do everything that I can humanly possibly do to make sure that all of our children are given the opportunity to succeed. And I hope others will do the same. And as far as how it relates to, um, on the other end of life, at death penalty and criminal justice, what are your views related to that, again, based on your faith? Well, you know, I, um, I'm not a big fan of the death penalty. You know, I subscribe more to uh, life without parole. Uh, number one, you know, if you're going to have the death penalty, then basically what you're saying is that you have a very perfect system where you're able to judge. You know, we do not live in a very perf in a perfect system. It simply doesn't exist. You know, uh, so I'm not a big fan of the death penalty. I think life without parole is a better system. And there have been too many cases, just like even with the Innocence Projects, where there have been people who have been uh, convicted and sentenced, and we later find out that they did not commit the crime at all. And so when it comes to the death penalty, I'm not one that's in favor of it. And everybody's okay in background? Mm -hmm. um, we're just using different cameras. Sure, no problem. Um, and another one we've heard this session mentioned quite a bit is the God-given right to bear arms. Um, and <laughs> constitutional carry, open carry, campus all, carry. All of that, know. all of that, yeah. What do you make of that? Uh, I'm, number one, I'm not trying to take away anybody's guns. Okay. Now, do I believe in open carry? No. Do I believe in the, in the right to, for college kids to be walking on, on the campus with guns? No. Do I believe in the Constitution? Don't have that right to carry where you don't need a concealed hand permit. No, you know. Now, um, do I believe that people are entitled to have their guns in their homes and go hunting? Yeah, absolutely. Do I have guns in my home? Yes, several. Okay. Um, I think I think you have to have policy with rationality, uh, which means that yeah, the Constitution, the Second um, Amendment does give you the right to own and carry guns. I support that. Okay. Uh, but I don't think you need to take it. You can take anything to the extreme. Do I want to, do I want to see people on the University of Houston campus or University of Texas campus and they're openly carrying guns? No. There's a great deal of violence that's already taking place with the policies that we exist today. Uh, I don't think we need to push the rationality or push uh, things to, their, to an absurd position. I think at some point in time, I think all of us have to kind of, kind of um, get centered. Um, and then, and on the other hand, too, at the same time, I think you do, there's nothing wrong to taking measures to protect yourself. But even my faith tells me that, you know, 
if I was capable of doing everything to protect myself, then there's no need for me to have a faith at all. Why do I need to rely on anybody else? Why do I need to rely on God when I'm able to do it all by myself? There comes a point in time when I think you implement reasonable policies and then you have to believe that the God that you serve, the God that created you, is the same God that will protect you. I believe that. So I want to operate within reason, but I also recognize that God is omnipresent and that it is God that protects me and not me myself. It's God that sustains me, not me myself. And I, and I have to believe that what I cannot see, he can see. And if I just operate within his will, I will be okay. Representative, finally, um, in your 13 years, how have you seen the role of faith and, and religion playing a role in the legislature? In the Look, House? if I didn't believe, I would have been gone from this place a long time ago. <laughs> Ooh, Lord, it takes some faith. You have to believe that you that you're here for let me speak for let me speak for me. I can't speak for somebody else. If I didn't think that yeah, I was here for a purpose, if I didn't think that for this moment in time, for the years in which I've served in the legislature, that uh, God didn't intend for me to be here, I would have been gone a long time ago. And even and even at there were times when I sought to run for office that would have taken me away from here. And did, not, and did not get it, God returned me here. Um, and with that understanding, regardless of whether the House is democratic, democratically controlled or Republican controlled, my belief is, you know, Lord, you placed me here. I didn't place myself. You put me on these committees. I didn't do it myself. And with that being the understanding, now give me the tools that I need to do to be effective and to do your will. Why is it now time to leave? Because I think you have to recognize, I think we all operate in our seasons. My faith says that when your season is over, then you have to transition out. Now, do I want to stay? Yes. Do I, do I love the Texas House? Absolutely. Do the people in my district want me to stay? I believe they do. But with, and with all of that being said, when your season is over, even when you want to stay, and even when other people want you to stay, it's time for you to move on. My season at the Texas House is coming to an end, whether I like it or not. Not an easy thing. No, no, because I don't. If it was up to me, I might want to stay. Um, but if you believe that you, if you believe that your life is purpose driven, and if you believe that you're not just ordering your own steps, then there does come a point in time that even when you want to stay someplace, when that purpose at that place has been fulfilled, it's time to move on. And sometimes you do it even when, you, when you're, not, it, you're conflicted by it. But I didn't want to come to the legislature. It was not my desire. It was, a, it was an older lady in my district who told me, State Representative Clint Hatton is not running anymore. And I am telling people you are running for state representative. And I said, Ms. Shepard, I have no desire to be a state representative. And she said, young man, you don't know what you want. So I'm telling people that you're running. And then you take a look at it, and then you come back and you, and you tell me later. Well, I did take a look at it, and I decided, OK, why not? And I did. But it wasn't on, it wasn't on my, my career plan. That was not a part of my plan. Uh, but I'm glad I did. And, uh, and I didn't intend to stay more than 10 years. 
I ended up staying longer than 10 years. Uh, and I'm glad I did. Well, now there's still a lot that's, that needs to be done. You know, people still need to be represented. All of those issues that we've talked about, they're still out here and they will be here next time. Um, but, but my season, my, my season here is over. And, uh, and I recognize that. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you.